Chapter Twelve of Twenty Minutes Late by Pansy. The Slibrivox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve. So you want to go home? Yes, Mrs. Bryant had faced that possibility with a sinking heart the moment she read the news of Daisy's illness. Ben and the little sister, in their eagerness or ignorance, had not thought of it. Not so the mother she realized that caroline worn with watching and unusual responsibility would be a much more probable victim than caroline fresh from home and in good health and strength but that part we must leave she said to mr holden it is very clear to me that the dear child is doing right for it would go harder with the sick one if she were fretted by caroline's leaving her it might even increase the fever to such an extent as to endanger her life i dare not recall my daughter but it is very hard to leave her there if i could only go myself and save her strength and see that she takes care of herself that is another thing you must leave mr holden said brightly is it not a blessed thing mrs bryant that you and i have a sure resting place in our perplexities and burdens do you have any burdens she asked the quiet-faced minister a curious look as of a pain which he must hide swept across his face for a moment even as he smiled every heart knoweth its own bitterness he said we have the lord's word for that i ran away from this disease with caroline when she was a baby mrs bryant said gravely after a moment of silence i was thinking last night how much better it might have been possibly now if i had not done so then mr holden laughed outright that is borrowing trouble certainly he said i have known many people who borrow from the future but i think it is rather new to try to borrow from the past dear friend how can you be sure you would have any daughter caroline on this side if you had not tried to shield her to the best of your knowledge and conscience that is true she answered and her smile was free again i suppose no one borrows trouble on all sides more foolishly than a mother but indeed mr holden this new disappointment in regard to caroline has almost unnerved me i am used to having my children in the nest i was so sure that my daughter could not go away from home this winter i tried to plan for ways and means for her to make a visit and when i decided that it could not be done there was an undertone of gladness over the thought that the family circle would be unbroken but the brinkers were not destined to have so hard an experience this time daisy was sick enough her mother said but she didn't hold a candle to the other by which i suppose mrs brinker meant to convey the impression that although daisy certainly suffered some pain and much weariness she was by no means so sick as her little brothers had been though why the good woman thought holding a candle had anything to do with it must be explained by those who have fallen into the habit of using slang phrases instead of good english but if the illness was not so severe daisy was almost longer than the others in getting well and was so weak and nervous that a mere hint in regard to caroline's going away would serve to throw her into a crying fit sure to be followed by more or less fever so it was that the two weeks to which the poor girl had limited herself had more than passed away and still the day was not set for her home-going i really think daughter that you may conscientiously fix the date now her mother wrote the little girl you say is gaining every day it is surely time for her to begin to exercise self-control and remember that you have been long away from your own daisy tell her how patiently and uncomplainingly your little sister her namesake has given you up for her all these weeks and yet how eagerly she watches the mails in hope of hearing good news of your coming perhaps it will help daisy brinker to grow unselfish herself not that i would censure the poor little girl indeed i think she shows good sense in wanting my caroline by her side as long as possible mother knows just how much she misses you daughter 
but she can never put it into words this letter full of sweetness though it was made caroline feel as she expressed it to herself ready to fly she went downstairs resolved to ask the doctor that very day if he thought it would do any harm to set daisy brinker to crying in real earnest over her departure she and the doctor had become very good friends during all these weeks not that they said much to each other at least caroline had never realized that much had been said to her the doctor was always in as much haste as the condition of his patients would admit and confined his talking chiefly to very careful directions connected with them nevertheless he had observed the quiet womanly quick-motioned young stranger and knew more about her than she could have imagined possible also he had occasionally asked a question or two with a view of drawing her out and was really fairly well acquainted with the bryant family and their circumstances though the questions had been so far apart and apparently so disconnected that caroline had no suspicion of the truth so you want to go home he said wheeling around from the last step to look at her it was on the white doorsteps that she had to carry on most of her conversations with the doctor why should you be in haste to go there i should think now that there is a possibility of your being out of prison you would want to stay and see a little of our great city it is unusual for people to spend six weeks in philadelphia and not go a block away from the house where they are staying caroline laughed pleasantly i suppose so she said but the truth is i want to see mother and ben and daisy more than all the cities in the world put together then you really are very homesick he asked eyeing her so keenly that she blushed and was troubled and hardly knew why i want to go home very much indeed if that is what you mean she said i was never away from mother before and you know i did not intend to be this time do you think it will hurt daisy if i begin to plan to go i was not thinking of daisy was the curious answer and the great man still stood looking thoughtfully at her i was well perhaps i will not speak of it now i have hardly time he drew his watch as he spoke and seemed startled over the lateness of the hour i'll tell you what we'll do he said after a moment's silence i am in haste now and so are you i hear daisy calling you she considers you essential to her comfort you see but i want to have a little talk with you more at leisure if you will come around to my house this afternoon say at three o'clock i shall be at leisure perhaps for a few minutes and i will be able to tell you then what i think about this home going it is true i may not be able to see you i may not be at home a doctor has no time of his own you know but if you care to try it i will be there if i can much wondering and not a little disappointed caroline promised and went back to daisy with a grave face i almost believe he thinks i ought not to go for another week she said to herself but i do not see why daisy is growing real strong now and he said he was not thinking of her anyway it can't be that he thinks i will have the fever even yet the time is surely past oh dear i suppose i can wait another week even if i must but it does seem to me sometimes as though i can't it was quite an event in her day this getting ready to go to the doctor's at three o'clock as the hour drew near she dressed herself with great care and thought how strange it was that she should be planning to go out on a city street and call on one of the great doctors what could he possibly want to say to her if ben were only here to go with her how nice it would be she had much trouble getting off poor daisy who had had her own way exactly for a fortnight save where the doctor was concerned made herself and everybody about her as uncomfortable as possible over the dreary fact that her dear caroline was going out walking and she must be left at home she cried and refused to be comforted 
and her mother who at first coaxed and petted and promised to amuse her every minute until caroline should return finally lost all patience and called daisy a selfish little girl who had forgotten there was anybody in the world but daisy brinker and said in plain words that she was ashamed of her this return to plain speaking seemed to do the little girl good caroline had the satisfaction of noting that the low fretful wail had quite ceased before she closed the front door as she rang the bell at the doctor's door and stood waiting to be admitted she naturally thought of that sunday evening now seeming so far in the past when she had stood here ringing and waiting how many strange and utterly unexpected and really dreadful things had happened since then suppose somebody had told her that night that six weeks afterwards she would be ringing that same bell and would not in all those weeks have had a glimpse of mother and ben and daisy she would have looked at the person with horror and assured him that such a thing could not possibly be that she was going home to-morrow yet here she was still it was not all unpleasant there was in caroline's heart a satisfied feeling that she had been a very useful person during these trying weeks and now that they were over she could afford to be glad i am sure i do not know what poor mrs brinker would have done without me she said to herself and it was no more than that good woman echoed in her hearing many times a day oh they were grateful and would never forget it of her never conductor brinker was anxious to convince her of that fact besides said caroline with a gratified smile creeping over her face i know a great doctor now know him pretty well think of my standing out on the steps asking him questions the smile became broader as she remembered with what fear and trembling she had stood there on that first evening how she had dreaded to speak at all and had tried to plan just what words she would use now although she had an immense respect for the doctor the feeling of almost terror had passed she was able to answer his questions without stammering and generally to look into his face when she spoke without blushing visions of long talks with fanny kedwin and rufus in which she would describe this doctor and his house and his carriage and the numbers of people who were always in waiting in the reception room came to her pleasantly fanny kedwin had been rather fond of talking about her uncle dr freeman who drove two horses and was sometimes called to the city ten miles away in consultation caroline did not know how many horses dr forsyth kept but she knew he was consulted during every minute of his office hours and she had heard people wonder when dr forsyth ate or slept he is one of the biggest doctors in the city conductor brinker explained and he won't go into the more fashionable part of the city to live either because this is a handy place for people to get at him and because some who are poor would not dare to send for him if he lived far away he is very good to poor people charges them less than the second-rate doctors and shows them more attention that he had shown the sick children at conductor brinker's the most patient attention caroline could witness and every word she heard about him but added to her sense of his greatness yet here she was coming by his own direction to have a few minutes talk with him she was in the reception room by this time which to her astonishment was empty the young man smiled in answer to her look of surprise and said the doctor's office hours are over but he told me to admit you and ask you to wait you are caroline bryant i think caroline as she sank into a sofa asked herself if it could be that she really was caroline bryant and what fanny kedwin and rufus would say when she described this room to them and then her heart began to beat so hard at the thought of seeing them perhaps in two more days that it almost took her breath away the doctor has been called out the young man had explained but he hopes not to be long gone and you are to wait if you can then he had left her to the silence and elegance of the room 
it was in reality a large plainly furnished room fitted up with conveniences for waiting people but to caroline it looked very grand indeed very softly the door opened so softly that the young girl who had drawn aside the heavy curtains and was looking out upon the busy street did not hear it a small slight figure with a shower of short curls about her face the color of the sunlight came on slippered feet into the room and pausing midway gazed with a curious mixture of shyness and thoughtfulness upon the stranger even on this winter day she was dressed in white a soft white wool belted by a broad band of white ribbon her face too was white not a touch of color about her anywhere to caroline's startled eyes when at last something made her turn her head the child looked something as an angel might are you caroline said the little white spirit speaking in a slow low voice i am dorothy forsythe and papa said i was to entertain you until he came whereupon caroline smiled reassuringly and held out her hand yes she said i am caroline and i like to be entertained how are you going to do it i don't know i might show you pictures do you like pictures or we might talk i like to talk myself very well said caroline by all means let us talk what do you like to talk about all sorts of things i suppose i like to talk better than other people because i cannot run and play like other children i have to walk carefully and but a little way at a time and i cannot ever run i am not like other children the voice in which these sad words were said was very quiet and self-controlled it was as if she was merely stating a fact in which she had no personal interest of any sort but caroline was startled and shocked oh poor little girl she said what is the matter it is something about my heart said dorothy in the same quiet matter-of-fact tone it has always been so papa has tried and tried to cure me but he cannot and by and by i cannot walk any more at all he thinks and i must never run he says until i get to heaven i shall be quite well there you know yes said caroline low-voiced and shading her eyes that the child might not see the tears which were gathering in them the little thing could not be older than her daisy and as she thought of daisy's tripping feet this story seemed too sad do not cry said dorothy gravely i never do any more not about this i made up my mind not to because it makes mamma feel worse and mamma is sick and has to be taken care of papa depends upon me not to let her feel worse about anything so i do not cry any more it does no good you know if it would make me run and hop i suppose i could cry for a whole week but it only hinders so what is the use that is true said caroline as she choked back her tears and smiled what a curious little fairy philosopher this was i think you may talk to me if you will said dorothy beginning again before her guest could say more i like to be talked to and i don't have it very often papa has not time and mamma is sick and nurse well nurse is good but she does not know how to talk about some things for instance she does not know what they do at school nurse never went to school when she was little and she cannot think what they find to do all day little girls as young as i you know and she and i have wondered and wondered until she is tired of it but i am not i want to know all about it could you tell me some things the wistfulness in the tones was almost too much for caroline's tears she had never heard anything which seemed to her so pitiful but she held them back with resolute will and began to describe in detail a day in school as she had often lived it dorothy sinking on a low cushioned seat in front of her and listening like one fascinated 
they were interrupted by the sound of a key in the lock and a quick step in the hall that is papa said dorothy rising at once i must go now he cannot be hindered when there are people in this room waiting for him i shall tell him you entertained me beautifully and i hope oh i do hope you can finish the story for me some time she clasped her hands with a sort of suppressed eagerness as she spoke and then slowly softly moved away reaching the door just as dr forsyth opened it he stooped and kissed her without speaking then advanced toward caroline well he said i had to keep you waiting after all but you have made acquaintance with my dorothy i see now i must talk fast he looked at his watch as he spoke i had hoped to have more time and make my suggestions a little less abruptly but there are those waiting for me who need my help and i must just plunge into the subject at once this little girl whom i feel sure you have enjoyed is our only one and is the frailest flower that blooms i am afraid it is only by utmost care that we have kept her here at all we cannot hope to keep her for many years you do not need to be told that she is very peculiarly dear to us and that we long to gratify all her desires one of them is to go to school to a regular school such as other children attend she has been brave and unselfish in this desire but no home governess or home study has been able to meet her evident longing wish in this matter we would like to gratify her and have been afraid to her mother is an invalid and her whole frail life seems bound up in this little girl she does not like to trust her out of her sight and yet is too ill to have her with her very much there is a school a semi-kindergarten for children who have outgrown the kindergarten age i should like to send her to it there are some reasons why i believe it would be good for her to mingle with other children and see how they live and what they have to do and be but we dare not trust her with a servant the school is a mile away from my house i could take her to and from it in my carriage if i could command my time but i cannot she could go in a street car if there were some one always with her whom we trusted some one to see that she did not walk too fast or step too suddenly or sit in a draught or be wrapped too warmly or not warmly enough in short some one who would think of her and care for her as an older sister who loved her might do she would also need a loving oversight while at school such as that same elder sister could give the trouble is she has no sister the sentence closed with a smile so grave and wistful that caroline who had been looking earnestly at him felt a strong desire to cry but his next words checked the tears and made her heart beat fast you would like to know why i am telling you all this it is because i have thought that you might find it in your heart to take the place of that sister which my little girl so greatly needs the kindergarten department of which i told you is connected with an excellent school for girls of your age and if you would stay here this winter and undertake the care of our darling we would send you to this school clothe you properly and give you in every respect the comforts and advantages of a home and pay you a dollar a week for your spending money now what do you say will it be of any use for me to write to your mother or must you go home End of chapter 12chapter 13 of 20 minutes late by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 13 the unexpected happens in mrs bryan's kitchen utmost order reigned not only the kitchen but the little shop as well as the study which the initiated will remember all belonged to one room wore an air of expectancy the very dollies in the pretty show window seemed to be listening and their sweet puckered lips looked almost ready to say we believe she is coming we think we hear her step as for daisy bryant nervousness had almost gotten the better of her she had wiped the dishes and helped to set them away 
she had dusted every article of furniture in the suite of rooms she had arranged and rearranged the dollies until she was sure they made as good an exhibit as possible and there was literally nothing else to busy herself about what could she do but watch the slow moving hands of the slow old clock and walk back and forth from the window to her little chair in the study and hold herself by main force of will from either shouting or crying in her highly wrought nervous condition she felt almost equally ready for either the condition of things was just this the bryant family had elected that this was the day in which their caroline was to arrive so certain were they of this that one of the precious chickens of daisy's own raising had been killed and dressed and was at that moment gently stewing on the back part of the shining stove making itself ready for the five o'clock grand dinner which they meant to have in honor of the homecoming some delicious spitzenberg apples were sputtering at one another in the oven making ready for the same feast there were potatoes just ready to pop into the kettle to be boiled and mother bryant was at that moment engaged in putting the finishing touches to a wonderful rice pudding which she knew how to make delicious without eggs or cream oh the dinner was to be everything that heart could desire the only question was would she be there to eat it they had discussed it in all its probabilities at the breakfast table that morning ben and daisy with the assurance of their years and the mother coming in with her notes of warning remember children she has not written positively that she would come to-day no but mother what would hinder her any longer i am sure she has been long enough and of course she is in a hurry the little girl is better and you know she said she was almost certain the doctor would say yes and if he did she would surely start this morning of course she would not need to wait to write she would know well enough that i would meet every single train all true ben dear but many things might occur to hinder her the conductor might have reasons why he thought it better for her to wait until to-morrow or the doctor might suggest her waiting for reasons of his own perhaps it is not probable but what i want you to remember is that it is better not to be certain of things i like to be certain said ben speaking almost crossly he was so anxious to see caroline poor fellow i have been kept on uncertainties long enough as for daisy she had no arguments to put into words and could only say with a curious little catch in her breath which told the watchful mother how much her heart was set upon it i think she will come to-day mother i do indeed and now it was nearing the hour when she ought in all reasonableness to be expected if the day was to bring her it had been a long nervous one to get through with the little family watched for the ten and three o'clock mails half uncertain whether to hope for or to fear a letter but when none arrived their hopes grew strong even the mother allowed her heart to say the dear child must surely be coming to-day ben had announced as he dashed in to report no letter in the three o'clock mail that he should not come home again until he brought line with him i shall go straight to the station from the office he announced gleefully and as soon as our four feet can bring us you may expect to see us walk in have your nose at the window-pane daisy linda for line will want to see it the first thing little need to urge her to that the small nose began to flatten itself against the pane nearly an hour before the train was even due though mrs bryant had nearly worn herself out with schemes for keeping her little daughter busily employed you begin to think she will truly come don't you mother the undertone of plaintiveness in the question went to the mother's heart daisy was frailer than usual this winter some way her colds which were always things to be dreaded had worn upon her more than ever before she had a slight one now which was the reason why she must forego the eagerly planned pleasure of meeting line at the depot we will think so darling at least and yet mother does not like to see her little girl set her heart so much upon it don't you remember that if she should not come it will be because our father thought it best she should not 
oh yes um said daisy with a visible quiver in her lips but i like to think he wants her to come to-day because we need her so then the train whistled and the mother was glad at least the suspense would be over in a little while it seemed a long while the apples sputtered themselves done and had to be taken up and even the potatoes which were not expected to be done just yet insisted on receiving attention before daisy at the window announced that ben was coming she heard his step around the corner then in a minute more he has turned the corner and oh mother he is alone never mind dear said mrs bryant going quickly to the window to put loving arms around her little girl and kiss her trembling lips perhaps ben has a letter which will tell us all about it and we shall have the fun of getting ready for her all over again to-morrow she didn't come said ben as he flung open the door but here's a letter i had to wait forever for the mail to be distributed then the poor fellow turned away and actually tried to hide his bitter disappointment in a whistle or two while his mother tore open the letter of course you want to hear it almost as badly as they did philadelphia december eighteen blank my darling mother and ben and daisy to think that i am sitting down writing to you instead of putting the last things into my trunk as i expected to be oh mother i don't know how to tell it and i don't know what to do do burst forth ben in uncontrollable indignation why in the name of all that is sensible doesn't she come home i wouldn't wait another hour for any little girl or doctor in the world oh please to listen ben pleaded daisy and the mother continued it is such a strange thing to tell and seems so kind of tangled up in my mind i want to begin at the end and work my way back to the beginning somehow but i guess i won't i'll make it tell itself just like a story then daisy will like to hear it i went to dr forsythe's yesterday afternoon as i told you i was to do and i had the longest time to wait in the parlor he had to go out after all though he meant to be at home to see me while i waited the loveliest little girl i ever saw in my life except of course my own darling daisy came and talked to me she said she was dorothy forsythe and that she was not like other little girls there is something the matter with her heart she has never been to school and she wants to go very much her father said it was the desire of his heart to indulge her because he could not hope to have her many years just think although he is so great a doctor he cannot cure his own little girl to save his life ben could not help interrupting again with a groan of impatience mother what in the world is she waiting to tell us all that for why doesn't she come home have patience my boy said mrs bryant and read on oh i cannot wait to tell you all about it the doctor came and was in a hurry after all and said he must talk fast and mother he wants me to stay in philadelphia this winter there i have told the end in the middle after all he says if i will he can trust me to take dorothy to school every morning and bring her home in the afternoon and see that she has enough wraps on and not too many and that she does not walk too fast or get on and off the cars too quickly you see she is very very delicate and her face looks like an angel's i should think and he says if i will stay he will have me live at his house and get me all the clothes i need and send me to school and let me take music lessons and pay me a dollar a week for looking after dorothy and oh mother mother i want to see you so badly i can hardly wait to write the words but he thought and the worst of it is i thought so too that i ought to wait and write to you all about it and he has written this big letter which i enclose that will tell you the whole story ever so much better than i could but i knew you would read mine first so now they knew why caroline did not come on the five o'clock train there was more to the letter much more indeed but before it could be finished or the doctor's letter looked at 
mrs bryant had to stop and gather her little daisy in her arms and try to soothe the most heart-broken fit of crying she had ever seen the child indulge herself in and the mother was glad of it for she felt that tears however bitter were better than the still white-faced way in which daisy sometimes bore pain meantime ben walked the floor and gave vent to his long pent-up feelings by declaring that he thought line bryant was simply too horrid for anything and that if she liked little angels and doctors and things better than she did them she would better let them adopt her and not come home at all nobody paid the slightest attention to what he said and nobody knew that he did not mean a word of it better than he did himself i do not know when they would have got settled down again if it had not been for the chicken which took that opportunity to stick itself fast to the stewing pan and emit an odor which made mrs bryant drop letters and little girl in a heap as she said oh our chicken is burning and ran ben had to go to the rescue and bring her a dish and a fork and put the covers on the stove and when the excitement was over it was found that daisy had dried her eyes and was ready to hear the rest of the story it was later than they had meant it should be when the bryant family ate their supper mrs bryant had scrambled the extra plate and knife and fork out of sight and motioned ben to set away the extra chair before she summoned daisy who sat holding arabella aurelia close to her heart and clasping caroline's letter firmly in her left hand they had certainly plenty to talk about the solemn question over which each one thought and nobody cared to put into words was would mother write to line to stay or to come home ben settled it in his own mind that it would be ridiculous and absurd to think of such a thing why they might as well give line up altogether he assured himself that he should express his mind freely and say that line ought to have known better than to have waited to ask of course she was to come home and if his mother dreamed of such a thing as telling her to stay he should think they had all gone crazy together he argued it all out how he would controvert his mother's logic supposing for a moment that she had any on the wrong side and convince her that the thing was not to be thought of for a moment he wished she would begin the discussion herself twice he opened his mouth to say mother of course you will write to line to come home day after tomorrow without fail will you not but a glance at daisy's pale face and a realization of the effort that she was bravely making to shed no more tears and even eat a little supper held his impatience in check mother meantime talked only of the little dorothy she had a little sister once who had heart disease a beautiful little white sister who could never run nor play ball nor skip the rope nor swing and everybody loved her and felt sorry for her and she died when she was fourteen then mrs bryant went on to say that it was certainly a great honor which had been bestowed upon caroline to think of entrusting her with such a charge it showed plainer than anything else could what dr forsythe thought of their dear girl then she said as though it had just occurred to her why we have not read his letter yet i will read while you two finish your suppers it was a beautiful letter long and full with such a description of dorothy as a great loving-hearted father with one little lamb to love knew how to give and such words about caroline as a fond mother would love to read altogether ben's excitement quieted a little and he silently accepted his mother's decision that they would not talk over how to answer the letter until they had prayed and slept over it daisy apparently was very willing not to talk she looked pale and tired excitement and disappointment had worn her out she was quite willing to take arabella aurelia and go early to bed when the last things for the night had been done and ben turned away from bolting the door to meet his mother's gaze and she stood up beside him not in a protecting but in a caressing way and leaned her head against his broad shoulder as if for support and said oh ben dear what shall mother do 
can you help her to be unselfish and make a wise choice for her daughter one that she will not regret afterwards instead of breaking forth into a tirade as to the absurdity and impossibility of the whole scheme ben flushed and hesitated and choked a little and at last said huskily it is very hard on you mother and on us but it is a rare chance for line i suppose she has a talent for music and the city schools are he stopped just there he felt that he had said every word he could and had admitted a great deal of course there were many things to be considered before such an important letter could be answered ben did not expect to sleep a wink that night and even poor little daisy whispered to arabella aurelia that they must lie awake and think but before she had quite finished the whisper she was asleep as for ben he turned over three times but when he was ready for the fourth turn it was broad daylight the mother had not fared so well she made no resolutions as to wakefulness on the contrary she told herself that she must put it all aside and get her regular sleep and she did her best but from midnight until three o'clock she lay broad awake and went over the entire ground many times it was not until the breakfast next morning was well under way that she asked her question well children when shall we hold our counsel as to what to say to caroline both children were entirely silent at last ben his face flushing as he spoke i'm willing to leave it to you mother i know you will do the right thing was that not a beautiful thing for a boy to say his mother answered him with a fond appreciative smile and turned to daisy what does our little girl say daisy was even slower than ben had been of course you know best she said presently low voiced and sweet and i mean to be very good if i can whatever you decide because if i should be selfish about my line it would make me feel ashamed when i met that little dorothy in heaven mother and son telegraphed a look at each other and both felt that daisy had gone to the root of the matter nevertheless mrs bryant felt that in so important a question as this she ought to have counsel i think i shall call upon dr mather this morning and ask his advice she said thoughtfully after a few minutes of silence ben looked his surprise but said not a word dr mather was their pastor and it was so entirely reasonable a thing to look to him for advice that there seemed no words in which to express surprise nevertheless ben if it had been respectful would have declared that he would have considered it more appropriate for dr mather to come to his mother for advice truth to tell mrs bryant had come to her decision by a roundabout road she found that she wanted very much to know what mr holden would say about it but to go to him for advice would be discourteous to her pastor even though dr mather should never hear of it as he probably would not this true woman felt that her own heart would condemn it as a discourtesy and that it was not to be borne long thinking over the matter had brought her to that decision i shall call upon dr mather this morning End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of twenty minutes late by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen conflicting advice dr mather was in his study he frowned upon the servant who brought him word that a woman was waiting to see him to be sure he had not yet set to work in fact he was only glancing over the morning paper but then he meant to go to work in a few minutes and felt that his good intentions ought not to be interrupted mrs bryant he repeated in a surprised tone doesn't the woman know better than to make calls on me in the morning ask her if it is important the messenger returned it is somewhat so she says she wants to ask a little advice before the mail closes but if you are too busy she will wait dr mather tossed down his paper oh well show her in i may as well see her now and have it done with 
and mrs bryant came in she was a woman of good sense and knew that an apology was in order for intruding upon her pastor during his study hours she made it in few words and then told her errand briefly your daughter ah let me see i think i remember her her name is nancy is it not no sir it is caroline oh yes caroline she is a young woman grown i believe not quite said mrs bryant and she gave caroline's age ah yes well i am mixing her with someone else i presume i have a great many young persons to look after and you say she has been absent for some time has she been employed in this man's family no sir and as briefly as possible the mother went over the story of her anxieties concerning this daughter a story which she had thought everybody in the town knew oh yes the minister said again i think i have heard something about it well my good lady i cannot see why you hesitate for a moment it seems to me a royal opportunity such a chance indeed as comes to a person but once in a lifetime of course you will have her stay he said reassuringly to do otherwise would be to throw away a great deal the schools in philadelphia are exceptionally good and to attend them and at the same time have an opportunity to earn her own living will of course be the greatest possible relief to you do you know anything of dr forsythe ventured mrs bryant at length why of course my dear madam i know dr forsythe to be one of the leading physicians of the city of philadelphia i do not mean in that way sir i mean as to his character is he a christian that indeed i do not know but of course a man of that stamp holding the position which he does is a guarantee for your daughter's safety you have nothing to worry about and everything to be thankful for still mrs bryant lingered she hardly knew why she certainly had dr mather's opinion she seems very young to go away from home she faltered at last thinking aloud rather than speaking to her pastor oh well he said in a tone which was meant to be reassuring girls younger than she have often had to do it i know dozens who would be glad of the chance she has the fact is madam this is a workaday world and only a few people can afford to waste opportunities for the sake of a little sentiment then mrs bryant arose with a flush of her face and a flash in her eyes but all she said was i thank you sir good morning good morning said the doctor cordially i am glad you are to have such a lift there is a hard winter before the poor i fear if i can do anything for you at any time let me know he had certainly been kind and he had undoubtedly spoken the truth yet mrs bryant as she went quickly down the steps was conscious of feeling almost hurt she could not have put into words why she felt so and would not if she could one thing was plain to her she felt less inclined to write to caroline to remain than she had when she went up those steps she walked rapidly less because the morning was cold than because she seemed to have a certain amount of bruised feeling to get rid of in some way at the corner she encountered mrs kedwin who was going her way and who began at once to ask questions did line come last night she didn't why dear me how disappointed you must have been fanny and rufus were wild to go around there but i told them to leave you in peace for one night at least what's the matter line isn't sick i hope thus urged mrs bryant told her story humph said mrs kedwin you aren't going to let her stay are you i wouldn't if i were you not by a long sight we have feelings i guess if we are poor and you don't want your girl to be a common servant any more than i do mine line don't think of wanting to do such a thing does she she had spirit enough i always thought my fanny would blaze i tell you if anybody should make her such an offer she wants to do right said mrs bryant firmly and at that moment she felt that she would probably write to her daughter to stay by all means 
of course she does and she ought to begin by respecting herself and her mother why her grandfather was a minister the idea of her being a kitchen drudge for any man they do not want her for kitchen work mrs bryant explained and she would not be looked upon as a servant though that ought not to make any difference to her or to me we hope our self-respect goes deeper than that mrs kedwin oh now said mrs kedwin don't you go to being hoodwinked by any such notions i've heard such talk before about being looked upon as one of the family and given privileges and all that it goes for nothing they are the worst kind of masters and mistresses the folks that go on about such things i know them and as for your self-respect i know you have queer ideas mrs bryant but you can't carry them out not in this world a servant is a servant and nothing else and your line isn't cut out for one don't you go to submitting to it she might better work her fingers to the bone here at home i'm doing it for my fanny and i'll work harder yet if that is possible to keep her from such a life mrs bryant smiled and sighed she knew then as she had always known that she and mrs kedwin did not think alike about any subject under the sun and that with the best of intentions this mother was spoiling her daughter fanny filling her with false ideas of life and of respectability and working her fingers to the bone to do it nothing which had been said made her feel more like leaving caroline in philadelphia and so withdrawing her from the influence of such companionship as fanny kedwin's and others of her stamp if she only knew what kind of a man dr forsyth was and what kind of a wife he had mrs kedwin talked on eagerly but the mother who walked beside her lost all trace of what she was saying and carried on her own train of thought coming presently to this conclusion i mean to go and see him for a few minutes there can be no impropriety in it now since i have been first to my own pastor and i must come to some decision and not keep my poor girl in suspense she announced the decision aloud interrupting mrs kedwin to do so excuse me mrs kedwin but i must turn here i want to see mr holden a moment never mind the interruption said that gentleman rising to meet her pen in hand and turning away from his manuscript paper on the desk as he spoke i am always ready to see people on business and i know very well that some business will not wait did caroline come no need to explain her daughter's name and absence here the minister's tone was almost as eager as a boy's and his face grew sympathetically grave as the mother shook her head something has detained her for another day i suppose nothing serious i hope sit down and tell me all about it it was a relief to do so poor mother he said with a sympathizing smile reaching out his hand to her as he spoke you have a blessing and a trouble come to you through one in the same source have you not there was a rush of tears to the mother's eyes which some way seemed to rest the strain upon her heart it was such a comfort to speak to one who seemed to understand that she could honestly be pulled in two ways at the same time could be grateful and regretful and in doubt whether to accept or reject it is a great opening i know she faltered but then i know the minister said i have no doubt at all that it is loving-kindness which causes our blessings and our crosses so that sometimes we are put to it to tell which is which let us look at it carefully mrs bryant on all sides just how do the pros and cons present themselves to your mind in the first place there is the trial of doing without your daughter and that presses not only on you and on our brave boy ben but on the little daisy it is evident that you understand everything said mrs bryant gratefully i do not know how so young a man who has no family and no trials of his own can so readily enter into and so intelligently sympathize with the trials of others then once again there came into the minister's face the look which before suggested to mrs bryant 
a pain which this man had to bear he was silent a minute and so was she sorrowing over her last words lest they had started troubled depths soon he said dear friend i am half inclined to tell you a secret which will help you to understand that there may be shadows where the sunshine lingers i am not so young as perhaps you think me to-morrow i shall be thirty and i am not a man without home and family from choice you know miss webster well enough to realize something of what it is to have to tell you that she was to have been my wife and that seven years ago her case was pronounced hopeless never mind he said hastily as he saw the look of pain spread over the listener's face do not pity me too much dear friend it can never be other than a joy to be able to call such a woman as miss webster my best friend and i'm sure her father and mine has planned all the way which he is leading us and knows the best road i only told you so that you might make sure of my sympathy with trouble i am afraid i shall have almost too much sympathy for the little dorothy no she said earnestly that is the strongest hold for us all my little daisy has helped us in that she thinks she will be ashamed to meet dorothy in heaven if she is selfish about her dear line here they both laughed over this a tender laugh which answered instead of tears and the minister walked to the window and stood in the shadow of the curtain folds for a minute before he attempted to say more when he spoke again his voice had recovered its natural cheery tone well let us see of course for caroline it will be a fine opening there is first that opportunity which comes to god's child of doing a special good in a niche where it is hard to find just what will fit i know enough of your young daughter mrs bryant to be sure that the doctor has made no mistake she would be a great blessing to his little girl this gave mrs bryant another opportunity to see how different this man was from some whom she knew others had spoken of her daughter's opportunity for getting he spoke of her opportunity for giving and set it highest nothing had helped this unselfish mother more they went over the ground carefully after this all about the schools of philadelphia concerning which it appeared that this minister knew a great deal all about the probable opportunity for improvement and about how those at home would manage without the elder daughter especially the influence of her absence on the sensitive daisy that perplexes me said mrs bryant it will be hard for daisy to get through the winter without her sister harder than for us but it will also be very hard upon her to think that her sister gave up advantages and opportunities for her sake i know said the minister she is a very peculiar little flower and i think i know her well enough to say that the latter hurt would be worse for her than the first there is one thing said the mother her face flushing as she spoke i do not know what kind of a man this doctor is he is a great doctor i presume and he is kind-hearted and has a great influence already over my daughter which makes me all the more anxious for her what if he were not a christian man some people perhaps most people would suppose that that need make no difference so long as my daughter is a little girl and would perhaps hardly ever see the man in whose house she was employed but to me it does assuredly it does my dear madame and i am glad to be able to tell you that a more earnest christian man than dr forsythe it would i think be hard to find i do not know him personally but i know a great deal of him and his whole life seems to me to be christ-like then said mrs bryant drawing a long breath i am afraid i mean i believe that the matter is settled i am sure ben when he hears all that you have said will think that we ought to give caroline the opportunity hard as it may be for us and in some respects for her mr holden i do not know how to thank you for your kindness and i do not know how to express my sympathy for you in your great affliction i wish you knew how deeply i feel for you and how entirely i will respect your confidence 
i know it all madame the minister said even cheerily it is all right miss webster and i are in our father's hands and we trust him there is another world than this you know to say that caroline bryant's heart beat faster than usual when on monday morning she stood on the white steps of dr forsythe's house waiting for admittance would be to put it very mildly indeed in her next letter to ben she told him it thumped so hard that it seemed to her that the policeman just then passing would hear it and ask what was the matter more than that her limbs trembled so that they could hardly hold her and she felt sure her teeth would chatter the moment she attempted to speak she had just passed through a trying ordeal in bidding good-bye to the little brinkers and their mother daisy cried louder than the others but it is doubtful if she felt worse than the mother who declared that she could not feel it more if one of her own children was going away and caroline herself had shed some very salt tears and kissed them all over and over again and promised to come just as often as she could to see them and felt as the door at last closed upon her as though she were parting from all her friends she was glad to see only the young man who opened the door for patience and to be shown into a little room at the right of the hall to wait a few minutes quite by herself it gave her a chance to grow quiet and to ask herself what she trembled over surely she was not afraid of dr forsythe nor of dorothy and mrs forsythe could not be so very terrible poor caroline had lived a great deal in the week that was past since she wrote that all-important letter to her mother letters had sometimes travelled at the rate of two a day between her home and philadelphia since that time all the details of the remarkable plan had been explained and discussed as well as people a hundred miles apart could discuss them and now it was all settled caroline was to stay and put away from herself the thought of seeing her dear ones before june it all seemed very strange and at times very terrible when she thought of it here was she caroline bryant who had kissed her mother one october morning and gone out nutting expecting to be at home again before the sunset who instead must look forward to a sunset in june before she could kiss her mother again there had been a faint hope in her heart that the mother would think she ought to come home for a week or two and see them all and get ready to go away and in truth the mother had thought of it and counted her little hoard of money gathered for the supply of coal and talked with ben and shaken her head sadly and concluded that the home visit must be given up on account of the expense this was before caroline's letter came saying that she had hoped something of the kind would happen but had given it up because dr forsythe said that morning that he hoped she would be ready for school on the following monday the new term would open then and it would be the best time to begin and this was saturday and according to the doctor's plans she was to come to her new home as soon after breakfast as she could and get acquainted with them so as to be ready for her duties on monday her small plain trunk had been packed by mrs brinker's own hands the good woman dropping tears among the garments she had herself washed and ironed them with utmost care and even mended some of them as carefully as caroline's own mother would have done though over this last work caroline protested saying that mother always had her do her own mending i know child said mrs brinker and no doubt you can do it better than i can but all the same i want to do it there's so little we can do to show our love and gratitude and you have been an angel of mercy to us you know on the whole do you wonder that the young girl's limbs trembled and almost refused to hold her while she sat in the little reception room and waited and wondered what the doctor would say first and when she should see mrs forsythe and what she would say to her End of chapter 14
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 A Long, Wonderful Day. Good morning, said a cheery voice just at her elbow. So absorbed had she been with her own thoughts that Dr. Forsythe had pushed aside the curtains and entered noiselessly without her knowing it. Here you are, as fresh as the morning, which is fortunate for my little dorothy is in such a state of excitement and expectancy that i hardly know how she could have waited much longer she is at this moment taking breakfast in her room i believe i will take you directly there she will like to serve you to a glass of milk with her own hands you have breakfasted i suppose oh yes sir a long time ago said caroline following the doctor's swift movements down the long hall ah that is fortunate also because now you will not mind taking a second one with dorothy i was obliged to take mine very early also so dorothy and her grandmother had theirs sent to their rooms so there was a grandmother in this home caroline had not heard of her before and but for the fact that there was so much to look at would have set to wondering what she was like by this time they were at the top of the long flight of stairs, and were moving swiftly down another hall, where half-open doors on either side revealed glimpses of beautiful rooms, which reminded Caroline of Judge Dunmore's parlor. "'Here we are at last,' the doctor said, and he threw wide open a door on his left, bringing to view a room so lovely that Caroline could not repress a little exclamation of delight." it had many long low windows from two of which the morning sun was streaming it was carpeted in some soft thick stuff of a delicate cream color bestrewn with delicately tinted autumn leaves at one end of the room was a great white rug of softest fur near which was a large easy chair of luxurious pattern in the depths of which sat dorothy at this moment a pretty table drawn near her on which stood a silver salver with a dainty breakfast spread temptingly upon it there was a large alcove near one of the sunny windows the curtains of which being only partially looped showed a beautiful bedstead in white and gold indeed those two colors prevailed wherever one's eyes rested and the small golden-haired child in a white merino wrapper fitted elegantly into the surroundings has she come said dorothy raising herself on one elbow to look eagerly past her father then she caught a glimpse of caroline oh i am so glad now you will take some breakfast with me i have been saving it it is so very desolate to eat alone dr forsythe rolled a great easy chair to the table's side and motioned caroline to a seat before he answered the bell which just then tinkled that is papa's bell said dorothy nodding toward the little white knob in the wall it always rings when he comes to see me it is just as though the people knew he had stopped for a minute and did not want him to do you suppose i can ever tell you how glad i am that you have come you know i told you how lonely i got with only nurse to talk to of course i have others every little while but sometimes when i want them most i can't have them will you eat a piece of the steak it is very good i suppose i tried to eat some to please papa but i am not hungry this morning perhaps i can eat now that i have somebody to help me isn't it nice to have you all to myself do you suppose you will like me i do not see how i could help it said caroline trying not to laugh but i do not think i can eat much breakfast not this morning i had mine almost two hours ago yet while she spoke she put a bit of the steak to her lips and was forced to tell herself that it was very different from that served at conductor brinker's table it seemed surprising that dorothy could not eat such breakfasts as this presently she found opportunity to ask the question which she found was uppermost haven't you a grandmother dorothy yes said the little girl gravely but she is not at all like the grandmothers in books she isn't shaking her head as caroline gave her an inquiring look 
and waited for an explanation she is very good and everybody respects her the dashes stand for a curious little pause which dorothy made before she pronounced the word but she wears black silk dresses a good deal and ruffles and does not like to have them rumpled she does not have any place for heads to rest and be petted you know and she thinks that papa pets me too much and makes me have less strength than i would have she says little girls are brought up very differently from what they were when she was young and she thinks her way was the best she is father's mother and we all love her of course but she is not like a grandmother in a book not in the least caroline began to understand that day was a very remarkable one to caroline bryant several times during its progress she felt as though she must get by herself somewhere and write to ben there were so many wonderful things to describe but by evening she began to feel as though it would be of no use to write any letters she could never do justice to the subject dorothy's eager interest in her new possession did not flag in the least she spent the entire day in showing her through the rooms explaining the uses of many things which were entirely new to caroline and asking her questions about a life which was equally strange to her one experience gave caroline a mixed sensation she could not be sure which was the stronger pleasure or pain dr forsythe had looked in hurriedly to say dorothy you must not forget to take your friend to mrs packard's room and ask her to give her what attention is needed and it should be done before twelve o'clock you know then he turned to caroline mrs packard is the member of our family who does the planning and is buying for us all we wear as a rule what she selects as proper of course we are allowed an opinion which may weigh with her and may not she understands that she is to add you to her list and get for you what you may need between this and tomorrow morning it is merely a matter of business you know your mother and i have exchanged letters and we understand one another perfectly caroline felt that he added this last in kindness to her because her cheeks had flushed and her eyes dropped it seemed so very strange to have any other person than her mother planning as to her needs and it seemed so very trying to have to need things which her mother had not provided but dorothy took it all as a matter of course oh yes she said we must go to mrs packard directly has your trunk come caroline she will have to go through it you know to find what you need and you will have to answer dozens of questions it is rather tiresome but we will go at once and have done with it dr forsythe had already gone caroline drew back from the open door must i go she said pitifully to dorothy i do not think i need anything just now and it seems very strange oh but papa said so you know it is all very well for papa to say we have to do as mrs packard says but the truth is we have to do just as he says every one of us mrs packard and all and he has told her what to do for you you needn't mind caroline it is always pleasant to do as papa says come said dorothy and caroline went mrs packard was tall and grave with gray eyes and thin lips the gray eyes were very keen they embarrassed caroline she had a feeling that her thoughts were being looked at and commented upon oh yes said mrs packard this is the young person is it i remember well there is no time to be lost i should judge i had your trunk sent up to your room a short time ago we will look through it at once and make a memoranda miss dorothy will you come with us or sit here and rest your papa is afraid you will overtax your strength to-day i will come if you please said dorothy papa is always afraid of that i will sit in caroline's easy chair and rest as they crossed the room caroline had a vision of herself in the tall glass a somewhat overgrown girl in a dress which was too short for her and whose sleeves were not made in the prevailing style 
and whose waist did not fit so well as it used these things she realized as she had not before she began to realize them when mrs packard said looking her over from head to foot there is no time to be lost i should judge the first glimpse of her own room nearly took her breath away they had not been admitted when dorothy had undertaken to show it to her a chambermaid had assured her that there was sweeping going on and she must wait so caroline followed mrs packard into it for the first time such a lovely room opening out of dorothy's not so large as hers but sunny and furnished with exquisite taste even to a cunning little writing desk in the corner do you like it asked dorothy i wanted you here right beside me nurse sleeps on the other side of my room where the folding doors are at first i wanted you there but papa would not consent to it he said this was quite as near as the other if there were not folding doors and i planned how the furniture should be arranged do you like it it is lovely said caroline softly and it was then that she decided there would be no use in trying to put this day into a letter for ben mrs packard was a woman of business she went rapidly over the contents of the little trunk shaking out with unceremonious hand caroline's poor plain dresses which had never before looked so few and plain she made no comments even her questions were very few there is not much to ask about after all she said caroline could not be sure what she meant please stand my dear and let me measure you i think that will be sufficient without your going downtown ready-made things are never a very perfect fit but i think i can manage it i will take this dress with me and this sack and one shoe that ought to be sufficient caroline could only look on bewildered why her best dress and sack and one shoe should have the honor of going somewhere with mrs packard and what was to be the result of their journey was more than she could fathom there seemed nothing for her but submission at luncheon she saw the stately grandmother in her black silk dress and ruffles she looked handsome and dignified and cold so this is the child she said looking at her with cold blue eyes she is rather young to have charge of dorothy i think i can trust her the doctor said kindly sit here caroline this is to be your seat at table hereafter you trust too easily sometimes kent his mother said but the doctor only laughed and asked caroline if she liked grapes luncheon was hard to manage caroline did not know which spoon to use for her soup and which for her jelly and she dropped a tiny drop of soup on the elegant cloth and felt that the grandmother's eyes were on her it had startled and frightened her to think of having always a seat at this grand table without having given the matter much thought she found that she had not supposed she would take her meals at the same table with dr forsythe altogether when the brown head rested at last among the plump pillows of her new bed its owner felt that she had lived a month since morning and was never so tired before though what should have tired me said the puzzled girl i really can't imagine i have done nothing at all to-day i wonder what i'm to do i wish they had let me begin to-day once she had asked dorothy what her work was to be and the child had looked at her with a puzzled laugh and said why i don't know you are to be happy i suppose papa says that is my work one experience had closed the day over which caroline lay with wide open eyes thinking dorothy in white wrapper with her hair tucked away for the night had called to her new friend will you come and read with me here is a seat in my great wide chair it is plenty wide enough for two papa often sits here isn't it nice now will you read to me or shall we each read a verse caroline chose the latter arrangement and found that the reading was from dorothy's large beautifully bound bible her clear slow voice sounded very sweet rolling out the words 
we have a strong city salvation will god appoint for walls and bulwarks now dorothy had said at the close of the reading will you pray first or shall i caroline's cheeks were aflame i never pray aloud she murmured with the slightest perceptible pause between the last two words do you not i always do even when quite alone it is nicer i think it gets you used to hearing your own voice papa says so don't you want to begin to-night i couldn't hear you if you said the words to yourself then she had noticed caroline's glowing face and governed by a sweet impulse of unselfishness and care for the feelings of others had added but never mind if you'd rather not perhaps it makes you feel lonesome and homesick poor caroline you want your mother don't you for by that time the tears had forced their way down caroline's red cheeks and dorothy had pushed her bible from her to lean forward and kiss them away it was her slow sweet voice which said the words of prayer that night simple childlike words but wonderful to caroline because of their assured way of speaking as though of course she was heard and would be answered she prayed for caroline's home and friends by name and brought a fresh rush of tears it is true but they were not bitter ones the prayer was very short but its influence kept caroline awake long after her head was resting on its pillow uppermost among her thoughts was the question what would dorothy have said if she had told her that she did not pray at all of course i say the lord's prayer said the poor girl turning on her pillow which had already been warmed by her flushed cheek but that isn't praying it never sounds like her prayer it just seems to be saying over words she is a christian and so are ben and mamma and even little daisy oh dear me and the day ended in a great burst of tears there was another thing which troubled caroline all this long wonderful day she had seen nothing of dorothy's mother heard nothing concerning her it seemed very strange and to tell the simple truth caroline was afraid of her end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of twenty minutes late by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter sixteen borrowed trouble a broad beam of sunshine awoke caroline the next morning she opened her eyes suddenly and lay for some minutes before she could decide where she was no sunshine had ever succeeded in getting into the little hall bedroom which had been hers while at mrs brinker's oh she said at last aloud the word was partly a confession of the fact that she remembered who and where she was and partly an exclamation over the contents of the large armchair near her bed she stared at them for a few minutes then sprang out of bed and began an investigation the clothing which she had taken off the night before and arranged in a neat group as her mother had taught her had entirely disappeared in its place was a new suit complete even to the long black stockings very soft and fine which hung over the back of the chair it was also plainly to be understood why one of caroline's shoes had gone down town with mrs packard the night before here were two shoes that had never belonged to her before but which looked so exactly the shape of her foot that it was hardly possible they were not intended for her they are too grand for me said the young girl in a murmur half of bewilderment and half of delight but then i shall have to wear them or go barefoot they have taken my others i wonder if it can be that i am expected to put on this wonderful dress and before breakfast too she held it up before her as she spoke a soft wool dress of lovely olive green tints trimmed with velvet of the same bewitching shade and finished at the throat with a delicate edge of something which looked like silver lace-work caroline who had royal tastes felt herself tingle even to her fingers ends as they softly touched the velvet 
what could dr forsythe mean by ordering such a dress as this for her or was it possible that mrs packard had made a mistake and bought material altogether too fine and rich could it be intended for her anyway how did they ever find a dress already made which looked as though it might fit her exactly caroline's knowledge of city stores was limited neither did she understand how readily they could undertake to fit by measure a person whom they had never seen especially when so careful and capable a woman as mrs packard had seen her it really was surprising what a change a becoming dress made in the prevailing style wrought in the young girl her face flushed a brilliant red as she looked at herself from head to foot in the glass when at last she was dressed i do not believe fanny kedwin would know me at all was actually her first thought her second was a wish that mother and daisy and ben could see her and the third was whether mother would approve of such elegance surely she could not have understood what dr forsythe was going to do i ought to take it off said the poor girl sitting down in bewilderment on the side of the bed i ought not to wear such clothes we are poor and my mother cannot afford it and i am her daughter i do not know what to do i am sure there must be some mistake why did they take my own clothes away they had no right to do that her perplexity was taking the form of indignation when a knock at the door interrupted her thoughts may i come in said mrs packard really my dear i must say that miss watson did exceedingly well she was sure she could fit you from my description but of course i was anxious and the things came home too late to be tried last night i hope you like the dress it is very beautiful ma'am said caroline blushing painfully but and then she stopped well said mrs packard not unkindly is there anything wrong about them i suppose there is of course it would be surprising if ready-made garments fitted exactly it is nothing but what can be remedied i hope oh it is not that caroline made haste to say they fit beautifully but i thought there must be some mistake ma'am i was not to have such nice clothes at least i did not suppose i was and i cannot think my mother would like it i have nothing to do with that my dear said mrs packard with a quiet smile i followed dr forsythe's orders very carefully as i always do the smile for some reason made caroline feel very uncomfortable i think there must be some mistake she said with dignity we are poor and we do not dress in such nice clothes and i do not want anybody to give me what we cannot afford i am not an object of charity ben would certainly have called his sister some of his old teasing names if he had seen her then eyes as well as cheeks seemed to be blazing she was in the mood to take off every garment that she had put on and was only held from beginning the work then and there by the thought that her own dress had disappeared if you please i should like my own dress she said trying to control her voice and speak quietly i want to put it on of course you can have it said mrs packard very coldly i have not stolen it child i took the liberty to take it away last night because i saw there was a place in the sleeve that needed darning and i repaired it for you i will send it to you at once and your other clothing you will find in that large closet at the end of the bureau i might suggest however that it was dr forsythe's direction that you should be dressed for church when you came to the breakfast table that was why i took the pains to arrange everything for you last night that you might have as little trouble with it as possible this certainly is more becoming than the dress you wore yesterday but suit yourself with the mention of dr forsythe's name caroline's absurd anger which she did not half understand subsided but in its place was a great distress she could not get away from the feeling that this lofty woman with a disagreeable smile had made a mistake and fitted her out in a manner which dr forsythe would not approve would it be possible for me to see dr forsythe a moment before breakfast she asked and her voice was meeker than before 
i am sure i do not know mrs packard said turning coldly away we are not in the habit of disturbing dr forsythe in this house if we can help it he has very little time to himself as it is but if the matter is important enough you might ring the reception room bell and thomas will see how hopelessly formidable this sounded caroline felt as though she could never do it in the world and yet was at that moment exceedingly sure she could not go down to breakfast in what seemed to her borrowed plumage she turned away in despair and walked toward the sunny window just as another knock lighter than mrs packard's sounded on her door it was mrs packard who opened the door and let in dorothy good morning said the low sweet voice oh caroline how very pretty you look papa will like that dress i think how nicely you fitted her mrs packard i do not see how you could i am glad somebody appreciates it said mrs packard somewhat stiffly and she stooped and kissed dorothy as she spoke if caroline had not been so full of distress over her own imaginary troubles she would have seen that the good woman had tried hard to please and was hurt and disappointed over this way of receiving her work but the poor girl could think only of herself at that moment oh dorothy she said her face and voice full of distress do you think it would be possible for me to see your father just a moment before breakfast i would not hinder him but a minute and indeed i must see him before i can go downstairs of course said dorothy promptly papa always sees people who need him are you sick caroline oh i hope you are not sick i will ring my little bell which papa always answers himself when he can and you can come to my room and see him will that do if you want to speak to him quite alone i will stay here and wait for you she turned as she spoke and went toward the little white knob on the wall while mrs packard without more words left the room in a very few minutes dr forsythe's quick knock was heard at the door it was dorothy who answered it papa she said returning his kiss it is caroline she needs to see you then she vanished leaving caroline alone with the doctor i wanted to see you she began in confusion to ask or i mean to say that i do not think i can be dressed as you meant i think mrs packard must have made a mistake does not the dress suit you his voice was very kind yet caroline felt that she was not making herself in the least understood it is beautiful she said desperately too beautiful and that is the trouble i am afraid my mother would not like it and i do not if she doesn't we are poor and cannot afford such clothes but we have always worn our own clothes i mean the ones we earned and i she came to another abrupt pause was she not appearing as an ungrateful ill-mannered little girl how could she put her trouble into words and make dr forsythe understand but a light had broken over his face he began to understand let us sit down and see about this he said drawing a chair for caroline and one for himself you are afraid your mother would consider you too much dressed for the work which you have to do is that the idea i thought so suppose we consider it carefully your mother has placed you in my care for the winter to do certain work for me and to be guided by my judgment in return i am to furnish you with board and clothing now your clothing though i have no doubt it was entirely suited to the place you filled at home is not in mrs packard's estimation suitable to your place here besides it was of course wearing out as clothes have a way of doing in all such matters we of this household have a habit of deferring to mrs packard's judgment because she understands the points and because it is her duty to attend to them i gave her general directions and the amount of money which she judged after carefully estimating the probable price of things would be enough it seemed a very reasonable sum to me and she has not applied for more money 
but on the contrary has assured me that she has some left therefore i judge that she has done her work well and if the dress suits you everything is as it should be your feeling in regard to your mother's opinion does you credit if you did not understand that i was to furnish the clothes for this season and be the one to determine their general fitness for the place which you are to fill that being the case it is my taste you understand which ought to govern yours and even hers as to the question of other people's clothes which i think troubled you a little you are mistaken the clothes are yours and fairly earned or are to be i consider the services which you are to give me in return fairly warrant the expenditures which i have made otherwise i should not have made them so it is purely a business transaction but suppose it were otherwise and i had chosen to make you a gift i hope and believe that you are going to cultivate a nature which is fine enough to receive gifts from your friends even when they take the form of useful articles which you need any other spirit than that is a false one and has its root not in self-respect but in pride dr forsythe's tones had been kindness itself and there was a pleasant smile on his face as he looked at the red-cheeked girl before him but she felt exceedingly ashamed i have been very foolish i am afraid she said at last in a low voice under the power of his calm kind words her outburst seemed to herself extremely silly no he said gently not intentionally foolish you have only a mistaken sense of independence i think you will probably hear a great deal about that word and you cannot begin too early to learn that there is a false pride sometimes named independence which has no right whatever to the name but i think we understand each other now you did quite right to come to me with your troubles if you will always show such prompt good sense in getting rid of them we shall do nicely now if everything is straight we will get dorothy and go to breakfast at the end of one of the long halls was a pier glass in which our young woman could view herself from head to foot it was when she was ready for church that she stopped before it and took a survey she was certainly a very different looking girl from that short-waisted short-skirted one who had looked at herself but the day before her heavy sack of rough cloth trimmed with large buttons and her trim little hat with a nodding plume were not only unlike anything she had ever worn but were finer than fanny kedwin had ever appeared in though her mother spent more money than some people thought was wise upon her daughter's dress moreover caroline was softly smoothing her first pair of kid gloves while she looked and thought dr forsythe had said that everything was straight between them but it was not true caroline's difficulties though not of the same shade as they had been an hour before were still perplexing enough why should she have such pretty things and daisy her own little sister go so plainly dressed why should ben have to wear his shabby overcoat outgrown even last winter while she was in a plush trimmed coat of beautiful shape and fit how could anything be right however one question had been settled for her plainly she had hurt the feelings of mrs packard and as that lady in a neat black dress and wrap passed down the hall just then with head erect and a cold look in her eyes caroline shyly addressed her if you please mrs packard i like my dress and hat and everything very much they are beautiful and i think you must have had a great deal of trouble to get them i thank you very much i am sure i'm glad if you like them mrs packard said still somewhat stiffly i thought this morning that i had made a big mistake somehow and nothing was right caroline had much ado to keep the tears from showing in her eyes it was very trying to find that nobody quite understood her oh it wasn't that there was any mistake of that kind she hurried to say i don't know how to explain what i mean but my brother ben has to wear his old overcoat that he has outgrown and daisy hasn't had a new dress in a long while and mother wears here caroline's voice forsook her 
at the remembrance of that dear mother's much-worn black dress and old-fashioned shawl there came such a lump in caroline's throat as refused the passage of another word there was no need for more words at last mrs packard understood bless your dear heart she said in a hearty friendly voice don't you go to spoiling your eyes and making yourself miserable over such kinds of questions it is just this way you and i have to go to church and sit in dr forsythe's pew and be counted as part of his family and we have to look so that folks won't stare at us and think we aren't respectable what you and i call fine folks of that kind think is only being decent and things have to fit in where they are put the doctor understands this and plans accordingly and what we have to do is fit in where we are put bless you your clothes didn't cost half as much as you think i dare say the right color and shape have a great deal to do with such things and dr forsythe's pocket-book doesn't know anything is out of it he carries a different pocket-book from what you and i do i can tell you that caroline at once had a vision of a little paper pocket-book faded and worn and with exactly fifteen cents in it all the money she had in the world and she could not help laughing at the thought of dr forsythe being obliged to use it End of chapter sixteen